My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. One of the most endearing scenes in The Wizard of Oz is when the cowardly lion finds the courage to help his friend Dorothy. He discovers something within himself to transcend fear and do what he knows is right. And this did not require a bellowing roar. My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, Marianne Rodmacher, beautifully shares this sentiment. Marianne Rodmacher is a writer and an artist. She conducts workshops on living a full, creative, balanced life, teaches internet writing seminars, and works with individual clients. She's been writing since she was a child, and she uses her writing to explore symbols and find meaning. Her website is MarianneRodmacher.net, and she joins me this week to discuss her path and new book, Courage Doesn't Always Roar. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, Mary Ann Rodmacher. Welcome, Mary Ann. Thank you so much, Victor. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing everything that you bring to our world. Marianne, your bio says that your engaging dance with words started early on. Please share with our listeners your early path and how it evolved to the wisdom and beauty that you share with our world. Oh, that's kind of you to put it that way. Thank you. I was hospitalized as a toddler. I was not yet two. And through a series of unfortunate events, <laughs> Sounds like a book title for children, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I was a patient in two different hospitals for almost uh, four months. And during that time, much of the hospitalization was in intensive care. So no visitors and the staff, the interns, the medical professionals, the doctors, all took turns coming into my room, into my ICU tent, and they would read to me their reports, their evaluations. Some of the doctors would use handheld large instruments. Um, this was decades ago before tiny little recording devices, and they would record their patient notes. I was under two years of age, so they didn't think they were breaking any privacy laws. <laughs> and in that exchange, I came to love the sound of multisyllabic words rolling over a person's tongue. And I just became fascinated with the inflections and the rise and fall of one's voice and how words were articulated by different people. And I came out of my hospital stay with a mad passion for all kinds of words. <laughs> and that's, that's where it was planted in me. When did you write your first poem? When I was in second grade. Wow. Do you remember the poem? It was fashioned after the textbook at the time. So there was a lot of repetition. See my brother, see my brother, Donnie, run. He's running because it's raining. It's raining. Run, Donnie, stay dry. That was, it began like that. And there were several stanzas uh, featuring various members of my birth family. <laughs> Wonderful. Who were the authors and what were the books that inspired you in your life? I, when I read fiction at a young age, I read Phyllis Whitney Mysteries. And it inspired me because the characters in her novels were so perseverant. They were, they were keen to discover that which they did not know. And I was just so fond of that level of curiosity. And beyond that, I could not read enough nonfiction. I read the story of the first successful ascent of um, Mount Everest, 
I read stories of other places in the world that just seemed impossibly far away. And those real life accounts of adventure rooted in me, uh, even uh, not, not because I became a nefarious world traveler, but because I introduced an element of adventure into my ordinary life. Mm. Mm. Who else? Eleanor Roosevelt, her uh, autobiography, writings about her, the letters that she wrote and published, the daily newspaper articles that she wrote. I just found her pragmatism mixed with compassion absolutely fascinating. And as a young woman in the mid-century, I was inspired by all of her firsts, the first time appearing in public in a pantsuit, the first woman to take administrative visits to military bases and to war zones. Eleanor paved a lot of roads for women's rights and human rights. And I've heard you say that you're also a fan of Marcus Aurelius. Oh, so very much. I didn't know. I did not know that the manner in which I decided to approach life was patterned by a Stoic philosophy thousands of years old and uh, adopted, not formally. Marcus Aurelius never called himself part of that philosophic tradition, but they influenced him so dramatically. And subsequently, In my early 20s, having been made aware of this, I took the opportunity to do some real in-depth reading meditations of Marcus Aurelius. There's a reason why that document has survived for 2,000 years. It's absolutely remarkable. And it aligned with an internal compass of mine, and it informed much of my life philosophy. So you had all of this experience when you were young, and how did that manifest in your adulthood? It got taught out of me for about 15 years, <laughs> as is often the case. I, I was the student that most Sunday school teachers dreaded having in their class, <laughs> <laughs> because I was the one who said, so then if Jesus said this, then why <laughs> why can't I be a minister? Or it just certainly you know the kind of child I'm talking about. Because were you were you questioning authority at a young age? I was questioning authority at a young age, and I was having uh, wrestling matches with my sense of spirit and. Um, as I grew, I began accepting more readily the assessments that others around me delivered and became less connected to what I knew to be true within my own soul. Mm, mm. And how did that manifest in your career? Well, I always wanted to be an artist, but I didn't even make it into my freshman high school art class because the little test they gave before you could take that as an elective generated the assessment that I had no discernible artistic skill. Mm. So when I say that I allowed my inner knowing to be given over to people's assessments of me, I believed that for quite a while, even though my heart longed to dance with color and form. And uh, fortunately for me, I never stopped dancing with words. And even when I had the strongest impulse and I knew I wanted to start a greeting card company, I figured I'd have to go back to school and get a master's degree and get investors and learn everything that I didn't know before I could start a business. Tell us about your greeting card company. 
I started a greeting card company when I was 29 years old with 18 images, completely hand done. I'd worked in my share of uh, minimum wage jobs in my early years, and I wanted people of modest means to be able to purchase something that was both affordable and beautiful. And so I designed 18 greeting cards. I created my own lettering style. I created a, a badge of color that I hoped would be timeless and made them available in my state of Oregon and my neighbor state of Washington. And 35 years later, Victor, that exact same design and actually many of the 18 uh, initial greeting cards are still in production. That's wonderful. What a what a gift to humanity to give that that artwork and and your your words and everything that you manifested in those greeting cards and to have them. It's almost like going into a museum and finding these beautiful cards. <laughs> Thank you. My I uh, because of how I felt about my artwork, I never actually dreamed of. Uh, populating an art gallery, but I did dream and loved my local library. And I did dream of a day that I would have my name on the spine of one of these beloved books in a library. A dream that absolutely came true. Now, I've yes. read that you call yourself a recovering artist CEO. Why recovering? <laughs> because in the last 15 years, I have allowed myself, even with a high level of um, targeted completion dates and things that need to be turned over in final form to publishers, etc. I've allowed myself the joy of making beauty and form for myself alone. Not, uh, not as a CEO of a production art company, but rather as a discoverer, a maker who wants to use the form and the craft to create personal beauty that, ha that doesn't have to perform to a trend level or a commercial metric of success, but it, its only job is to allow me as a creative to make something. Can I join your club? <laughs> I wish you would. <laughs> Absolutely. I, th I think that's wonderful. A lot of the work that I put out in the world, the type of things that we're doing with this show and other things, I really do it for myself. <laughs> that's just If someone listens to it and gets a benefit from it, wonderful. And if not, because every one of these shows for me is a spiritual experience and a learning process, and I'm grateful to have this opportunity. So yeah. thank you for being with me today and sharing. The Recovering Artist CEO, I guess uh, I'm a, a recovering uh, podcaster or something. I don't know exactly how to call it, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's all special. It really is. And I, the other thing that I found is that when I've connected with folks on this show and other shows, that by the time the show is over, it's like I've reunited with soul family. You ever get that feeling when you get together with people? Yes. Yes. Because most of the time, someone that wants to speak with you or in to make it about in my own experience, a person who is drawn to have a conversation with me holds within themselves something that they've seen me reflect. Absolutely. Yeah. The people that, that are not... Uh, fans or don't enjoy what I uh, create in the world, don't find a way to come have a chat with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I had a wonderful spiritual teacher who would say there should be an 11th commandment, thou shalt have purpose. You write and speak about intention and purpose. Has your perspective on this changed throughout your life? Very little. It's changed very little. If I had to articulate a change to it, Victor, it would be that it has become more iridescent and morphic. The uh, people sometimes who come and train with me or work with me say, don't, don't you have a protocol? Isn't, isn't there? <laughs> do, you, do you teach a series of steps to 
lead an intentional life. And frustratingly for some, I don't because there, there are no prescribed steps for someone else. I can tell people what I have done and it's like offering a buffet table. They're not going to like everything that I put out on my table, but they should uh, take, fill their plate with what appeals to them and go nourish themselves. So my philosophy about intention and purpose when I was younger was more focused. Uh, in fact, I have a ruler, a 15-inch ruler <laughs> that stays by my desk. It's 20 years old. And on it are the four categories that I identified years ago that have the most drive and purpose for me this, this time on the planet. And even though it's old, it's, it continues to be relevant. I don't use it like a ruler. It's, I'm not rigid with it, but I do reference it as a metric to make sure that I'm saying yes to the right things. I had a teacher who used to say that everything is energy and intention guides it and puts it into motion. How do you define intention? Personal and deeply held longings and aspirations. So it's very different than a goal. It's very different than a plan, but an intention informs every goal that I have and my intentions uh, paint, craft my plans. I, I intend to be inspiring. I intend to be well. I intend to be creative. I intend to be in service. And so when I look at opportunities that come my way, I ask myself, do I get to articulate these fundamental drivers of my being in this activity? And if I don't, most of the time I, I, I just say no. That's an art saying no, isn't it? It is. It's an art. It's a grace. And in, the, in my context, Victor, it is a, an investment in another person. My no means that I recognize the grace, the gift, the opportunity that is in front of me is not mine. If I say yes when I ought to say no, I'm stealing from the person who truly belongs with that project, that plan, that opportunity. That's a wonderful perspective. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. You've written several wonderful and inspirational books in your career. Which ones mean the most to you personally and why? Honey in Your Heart is my personal favorite because my publisher not only gave me the opportunity to release a book in hardback, my publisher gave me the opportunity to release a book in beautiful color, and I got to illustrate it any way I wanted. I didn't have an art director. I just reveled in the opportunity to create art that complemented the sentiments that I was expressing. And I got to pick the graphic designer that rendered the book into its final form. It, it continues to be one of my favorites. It's, it's, um, its primary message is that the things that people say will make them happy are never or hardly ever the things that make them say yes or yay or skip a little or squeal. The things that get that little squeal in the course of an ordinary day are the simplest of things <laughs> and not the big giant possibilities that people talk about uh, when they talk about what they want to be when they're successful. It, 
it's comfort and a word from a friend and a beautiful leaf falling in front of you on a walk in the middle of autumn. These, these are the things that draw our breath in and make us happy in a moment. And so the honey in your heart are the little things that often get overlooked. That is so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. We're going to be talking about courage. It doesn't always roar in the next segment, but is there one more book that you'd like to talk about? One of your previous books? Victor, you know, it's like asking a parent to identify their, their favorite. favorite child. Uh, I mean, <laughs> um, oh, <laughs> do I get to get away with giving you that answer? Yes, that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. All Absolutely. Right. I won't hold you to it. My guest is Marianne Rodmacher. Her book, we're going to be talking about the next segment, Courage Doesn't Always Roar. Marianne, please tell our listeners where they can get your books and find out more about you and your wonderful work. Well, thank you. They can ask their favorite independent bookseller for uh, any of my books. Uh, They can buy it on Amazon and they can find out more about me, a little bit more, on my website, MarianneRodmacher.net. And you also offer services there, don't you? I do. And what are those services? (laughs) I deliver keynotes to large, uh, well, not, not, they tend to be large, but uh, any size group. I do customer service training with businesses and corporations. And I work with individual clients and small groups. Wonderful. And we'll be back with more of Marianne after these words on the Own Times Radio Network. The best of the holistic, spiritual, and conscious world. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Ohm Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going Om? My passion is sifting through information, research and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers and researchers pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4pm Pacific Time, 7pm Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. Today Today we we decided decided to walk to school. school. The The light light counted. counted. 15, 14, 31, I mean 13. We took took a a left left on on Carroll Street. Street. Danny's smart, but he gets distracted. I realized he forgot his homework. I hope he doesn't have another bad day at school. When you can see learning and attention issues from their side, you can be on their side. That's why there's understood.org, a free resource for the parents of the one in five kids with learning and attention issues. Go from misunderstanding to understood.org. Brought to you by Understood and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week, Marianne Rodmacher. We're talking about her new book, Courage Doesn't Always War. Marianne, there's a fascinating story behind the title of Courage Doesn't Always War. Please share that with us. A friend of mine came to my office years ago, years, decades, actually, in tears. She was an adoptive mother and didn't have the period of time that uh, pregnancy usually allows for a mother to prepare to welcome a small human. 
And she was terrified that she was ruining her child because it was so puzzling to her to have this little tiny life that couldn't articulate what it needed, what, what she needed, why she was crying. And she was exhausted and at the end of her rope. And in the moment, what I was able to do for her, her name is Margot, it was listen and assure her that I saw so many remarkable qualities present in her life and uh, assured her that I felt confident that she was not ruining the life of her child. She felt better when she left, but I felt like I had something to say that didn't come out quite the way I wanted it to. And so I began working on a poem that ultimately became shortened to courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. I wrote that uh, and have just, I'm stunned at the places around the globe that it has traveled. It became synonymous with the message of support shared here in New York and elsewhere after 9-11. How did that happen? And how did it make you feel? Oh my gosh. I'm, uh, I'll do, I'll do my best to tell this uh, with a full voice. The country was brought to its collective knees that day, September 11th. I watched the television that I had in my production studio with horror. And I tried to send all my staff home and none of them would leave except the, except the one that still had uh, small children. She, she went to fetch her children, but the rest of my staff wanted to stay, wanted to stay together. And in the coming days when it unfolded the horrific devastation that specifically at Ground Zero in New York City, what they were facing going to work every day. One of the firehouses in New Jersey, one of their websites put up that poem of mine. And that firehouse had it printed on a vinyl banner and put over the doors of their firehouse so that when the first responders came home every day from their shift at Ground Zero, they were greeted with my words. And other firehouses around the nation uh, checked in with their brothers and sisters in the fire fighting industry, saw the phrase, and started putting it on banners above their own doors. It, it gives, it, <laughs> it is such a rare thing as a living author to see something that I've written go to work in such a practical and tangible way. It just, it still, it still just gives me goosebumps. And the healing way. The many years later. Yeah. Absolutely. Tell us about the genesis of the book, please. There's a man named Arthur Bushkin who is responsible for an organization called the Kindness Cloud. And Arthur has admired my work for many years and some time ago reached out to say, I want you to know what this particular poem of yours has meant to me. Courage doesn't always roar. And I think, I think you have a message for the world that you, that you may be overlooking. I think that if you could expand that poem into other applications as to how courage shows up and what courage means, I appreciated his suggestion, but I, it wasn't a practice that was familiar to me to take something I'd already written and iterate it into a variety of applications. So I didn't act on it 
immediately. I sat with it and thought about it and con- contemplated the consequence of doing it. And as it happens with such things, an editor from one of my publishing houses contacted me a year and a half ago and said, you know, Courage Doesn't Always Roar is one of the most quoted pieces in the world. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing. Uh, it's, it's such a stunning thing to wrap my mind around. And she said, I really think that you might need to write a book that expands the meaning of the poem. Basically, in her own words, she was echoing this very profound piece of advice that I'd gotten from Arthur Bushkin. And so I started, I started the work. And they're very, they're, it's a collection of 189 essays, Victor. They are stories and examples and observations about the various names that courage goes by. Grit, chutzpah, uh, perseverance, resilience, nerve, guts. (laughs) Because there are lots of people on the planet who are deeply courageous, who don't see themselves that way. And it is hard to imagine because perhaps many of your listeners haven't had the experience of being afraid to go out their door. But think of the mamas and the papas in the world where children have known gun violence. And for a parent to send their child out to school in a community that has known that is one of the most deepest forms of courage that I can imagine manifesting. I don't write about that in the book, um, but I bring it up in conversation today because it's relevant. And courage can be, for one person, the capacity to put their feet on the floor in the morning. To get out of bed requires courage for some people. Absolutely. You you share a series of lessons, and courage doesn't always roar. Let's look at a few of those lessons. Let's start with courage doesn't always know where it's going. There are times in my life, I, 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 took, I articulate the lesson to myself in this way, know when to leave. Anyone who has ever stayed anywhere past the time that they should have knows exactly what I'm talking about. You maybe have given an organization or a person the 14th second chance. You may have stayed past your capacity to contribute to the organization. It takes a lot of courage to know when it's time to leave. It's sort of like Einstein's old expression that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. And it's human nature. This time, this time, I I know I'm not changing anything, but this time it's going to be different. The stopping that cycle, even though you don't know where you're going to go, Even though it might look a little scary, uh, it's scary in a different kind of way to stay somewhere where you don't really belong. This courage speaks to revolution rather than evolution. It does. Making a change immediately and dramatically and directly, not even dramatically, but directly when it's time to make the change. And a dramatic change, a direct change rather, can be dramatic. I had the opportunity to learn that someone unexpectedly delivered their resignation. It was a shock to everyone, but the resignation was dated eight weeks out. (laughs) So that's dramatic. 
it's not direct. Because if, if you're going to deliver, if you're going to make the courageous personal choice to resign a thing, a post, a job, be clear, be clear, and don't create the drama of an extended exit. I don't know if you agree with that. I agree with that 100%. And I speak from personal experience, having yeah. gone through that several years ago with an employer who did not deserve my employment. And I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to go into the details, but yes, absolutely. Yes. Direct, clear, and quick exit. Very quick. From a meeting to out the door in three minutes. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Including, well, ri- including writing the letter of resignation. <laughs> you're, z- you're zippy. <laughs> I'm zippy is right. Here's another lesson that you share. Courage doesn't always wait for every detail. Sometimes courage chooses a door and walks right through it. Tell us about that. I say there's planning, there's anticipation, there's research, there's interviews, there's reviewing maps, and really... One day comes along, you just got to get on the bus. (laughs) You just have to set aside all the things that you do not know and go. I traveled to Europe the first time when I was uh, 29 years old. And I think I carried one of everything I owned. (laughs) in the most ridiculously large suitcase and a backpack and a handbag and a money belt strapped to my rib cage. And Victor walking the concourse to my gate to fly to London, my backpack so heavily laden burst all over the floor. Wow, what a lesson. Uh, of the concourse, it just went skittering across the, the ceramic tile. And that was the first lesson of many lessons that we are defined as much by what we carry as by what we leave behind. Talking about getting rid of excess baggage. <laughs> you literally did that. <laughs> it's a pretty big metaphor alert. Absolutely. So without every detail being known, sometimes you just have to open the door and step out and get going. My favorite of your lessons in this book is courage doesn't always get it right. Not even the third time. Courage is the capacity to bring it fresh to the field the 10th time, knowing it was only a matter of time. Yes. The the lesson of failure goes back to my original poem. I will try again tomorrow. The, The try again may not work the second time or the third time. Even if it never works, Victor, the lessons that you extract along the way are a host of things that if you remember them, you know not not to keep trying them just that way. So courage is the capacity to say, I see I see it. I can close my eyes and imagine how it might work. And I have to just keep going to that field and trying again. If you think of the great inventions and the great inventors, I'm sure they would absolutely resonate with that remark. We we have evidence that they do indeed. Absolutely. And, And People on the manufacturing plant floor, people that are engaged in operational systems, uh, coding, software development, virtually every enterprise understand that you can't know what you don't know until you discover it by what doesn't work. Including writing books. Including, 
Yes. Absolutely. My guest, Marianne Rodmacher, her book, Courage Doesn't Always Roar. We'll be back with more of Marianne after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit humanityhealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese. And guess what? Egg rolls showed up like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky? Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for Inspired Conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Oh. Psst, Steven. Who said that? Me, down here. Oh, what are you, a yellow booger? I'm a banana slug, Steven. What are you doing in my room? I'm your sense of adventure. It's been a long time since we've had an adventure in the forest. Mom took me to the forest last year. I'm a slug, Steven. It took me a long time to get here. You're right. I should get out. Yeah, the forest is not that far away. Hey, Mom, come to the forest where the more adventurous you lives. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. When it comes to parenting, there are no perfect dancers. But that's okay, because you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on adoption, visit AdoptUSKids.org. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt US Kids, and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week, Marianne Rodmacher, we're talking about her book, Courage doesn't always roar. Marianne, what message of courage do you offer parents in an age where parenting is quite different from when we grew up? I tell them that I bow to them, first of all. <laughs> before, before I give any parent a message, if they're asking for one, I literally do put my hands together and bow to them. Mm. I believe that being a parent is the most important job in the world, uh, second, not second to none. And then, and then teachers come in uh, a close second right under parents for how our young people are prepared to go forward into adulthood. The autonomy that a parent 
empowers their child to have is one of the greatest gifts that I believe a parent can give their child. The autonomy of courage, the autonomy of knowing their own mind, the understanding of how it is that they agree to navigate the world as a family, and then to have the capacity to let that child go out into the world and articulate that autonomy. I, I think it just requires for people who do not have children, it's almost unimaginable what that takes. And what about advocacy in schools? Ask me more what you mean by that. How would you suggest that parents advocate in schools where local school boards are now making decisions that might have dramatic effects on the, on the lives of the students, on the lives of their children? Well, in an ever-increasing busy world, the first thing that I say to people that are interested is get on the school board, run for city council, uh, volunteer on the committee that chooses the books for your children's school have a voice. Uh, it, it has a consequence beyond just the amount of time that it's going to take you in the coming three quarters to do that job or articulate that position. And for parents, I have strongly advocated for decades a blank book and a writing instrument that a child likes and blank white pages of paper and markers, allowing a child the freedom to not color within lines, to not follow some textbook for artful expression, but giving them the freedom to articulate their view of the world in color and form and word is one of the greatest things that they can do to help their child develop a personal agency or an, an, an autonomy. That's wonderful. What about courage in the workplace? The first thing that I say is very hard for people to hear, but courage in the workplace means that you're willing to lose your job. <laughs> it, that doesn't sound particularly positive, Victor, but what I mean by that is that if it's a choice between articulating your values in a functional way where you work or having to remain silent for the sake of keeping your employment secure, there's a real dichotomy you have to face. People sometimes talk disparagingly about whistleblowers. It, it takes an extraordinary amount of courage to stand up in the face of an injustice or an act that is against the law and speak about it at the risk of your personal safety or your economic safety. Courage in the workplace, I think, begins on the day that you're being interviewed. When you show up for a job interview and are your authentic, true, unvarnished self, and that's who they hire, then you're in a good, you're in a good place because they know who they're looking at. When you allow yourself to be molded to what you think a company wants you to be, you're in a tougher place. And it takes even more courage to speak up or speak out when something unjust or untoward is happening. What about courage in relationships? Comes down to authenticity. I, <laughs> this is relatively disclosing and not necessarily very personally flattering, but I said to my friend a few months ago, and she reminded me of it just last week, I said, I can see a narcissist a mile away unless I'm getting ready to marry him. Oh. She laughed and laughed, which I did not. <laughs> I, would, I did not laugh um, because what, what that means is that 
people, smart people with a grasp of vital, viable, healthy relationships sometimes do not see that path absolute clear, with absolute clarity for themselves. And I know as an empathetic person that I'm inclined to see the core of a person, what a person can become. And that's why I made the joke on myself that I can spot a narcissist narcissist a mile away, except if I'm that close to them. And it takes, in this expression, Victor, uh, courage on on a podcast broadcast to identify such a significant deficit in my own being. But I have it. It's a deficit. It takes courage to admit it. And it requires an element of courage as I move forward in my life to be aware of it and not let it sneak up alongside me again. Absolutely. Lastly, what about courage as we age? It is remarkably important to be courageous as we age. I... (laughs) I just wrote a poem last month that um, begins growing old and the end is pack lightly Mm. because the journey that I took on my first trip to London with that giant suitcase is not a journey I could take now. And in fact, I did travel internationally last year And I did it with a backpack. Mm. The journey, the courage to age requires that you understand that there are different things that are needful. That what you needed, what I needed when I was 30 is not what I need in my 60s or I'm going to need in my 70s. And I look at the opportunity to age as the privilege that it is having lost many dear companions already, it is uh, often said that aging is a privilege denied to many. Absolutely. So the muscle mass behaves differently. Our digestive system changes as we age and lose certain uh, enzymes and capacity. And to not expect that our humanity will behave as it always has. Our intention can remain the same, but our body changes. So how I articulate my intention to be of service is different at this age than it was when I was 35. Absolutely. You paraphrased an old adage that you would rather wear out than rust out. (laughs) Please tell us about the origin of this and how you embody it. Argus Publishing, I don't know if they're still an enterprise. In the 60s and 70s, they produced inspirational posters, often, most often found on college dorm room walls. And I had that on my wall of my bedroom throughout my high school years. And it means to me that I do not want to sacrifice the gifts that I have been given to the opinion of others, the demands of society, or what our culture expects of the elderly for which I, offic- I, I think I officially qualify as, a, as an elderly person. <laughs> let, me, let, me tell you, let me tell you something. I turned 69 in January. I'm younger than ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a lot more than just an attitude, but age is relative to your intention and your purpose. And I know, I know elders who are not nearly as mobile as they were, who contribute remarkably to their family, to their community, to their country. 
the uh, the region, the area on the map of our life trajectory that is marked old age does not have to be a scary place Absolutely. at all. Absolutely. The wisdom, the words, the amazing sharing of Marianne Rodmacher. Marianne, one more time, please tell our listeners where they can get your books and find out more about you and all of this wonderful work. Well, thank you, Victor. My website is marianneRodmacher.net, and I hope your listeners will ask their favorite independent bookseller to have my books brought in to their shelf. And if that is not how your listeners get their books, they can find them on amazon.com. And one more time, tell us about what you offer on your website. I talk about, it it changes all the time, Victor. Uh, I'll outline the services that I can provide for companies and individuals. I often tell a story about one of my poems or aphorisms. You'll just have to go look. (laughs) Marianne, it has been a a genuine honor and a pleasure for me to have you with us today and and share your wisdom and experience and your beautiful, beautiful words. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week.